Shalom, Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live, World Harvest Television. Again, delight to be with you guys. I trust that the last two messages there, no doubt, probably kept you a little bit in suspense as well about the two witnesses and how that the prophetic stage is being set for their soon coming. Uh, there's going to be a lot more things we're going to be getting in, uh, getting into over the next few weeks here as we begin to look at prophecy. And it seems like Syria is becoming the flashpoint of prophecy. In fact, we do a radio broadcast in the United States on uh, uh, Hebrew National Radio there called Flashpoint. Do that with uh, Bonnie Harvey. Uh, every week it airs on Sundays and I believe Wednesdays as well. I haven't actually never uh, been able to look at that because I'm over in the Czech Republic, but it does air and I hope sometimes you get a chance to, to listen to us uh, there live on the radio twice weekly with Bonnie Harvey. Uh, very interesting uh, show indeed and we're always looking at uh, the news from a standpoint of prophecy and what will be the flashpoint that will ignite the world. So definitely check out that. And don't forget, be checking out our YouTube channel, Israeli News Live on YouTube and Danun Institute, our teaching channel, where we go into biblical insights from all different directions there. I'm sure it'll be a blessing to you, both those channels there, if you can check that out. Uh, but now we're going to go into Syria becomes a flashpoint of prophecy. And later coming up in the weeks to come, we're going to be going more in uh, depth with Ezekiel's prophecy, Psalm 83, uh, all kinds of things that I know will be a blessing for you there. But if you remember back uh, when we first started our broadcast here on um on uh, World Harvest Television, we begin to talk about the Isaiah prophecy. We begin to share with you how that the U.S. was uh, and British forces were gathering on the southern side of Syria on the Jordanian border. Uh, we shared with you, this was one of the articles from Press TV. We actually shared the first one from the Arabic uh, article that was the first one that came out. U.S., U.K., Jordan deployed troops, tanks in southern Syria. This, was, uh, this report on Press TV came out on May the 9th, uh, we were going into the movement of all of the troops even before they came out and showed the satellite footage. Uh, actually, I believe this was an aerial footage done. Uh, it actually says the aerial photo released by the Media Bureau of Syria's Joint Operation Command on May the uh, May the 8th of 2017 allegedly shows the heavy military presence of the U.S., U.K. and Jordanian troops in the Syrian Jordan border areas. Well, then we went in and we began to share with you how that the U.S. had crossed over into Syria near the Iraqi border, how that the, uh, the special forces were there, even the Norwegian forces had moved into, Sy into Syria with U.S. and British forces working with the Free Syrian Army there, setting up a uh, deconfliction zone. Again, this was not done with coordination with the Syrian government. Neither was it done in coordination uh, with the, uh, the 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 UN Security Council, etc. And we had been already discussing about how the implications of this was playing out because we were looking at prophecy. This was one of our first broadcasts. We aired it on YouTube as well that we did with you, Who Will Destroy Damascus? That was looking at Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 17. Going back, we'll just look real quickly at verses 1 through 3 as a reminder because we're starting to see the things that we were sharing with you here on World Harvest Television as well as Israeli News Live on YouTube where you've seen these things daily. It took them a few weeks to come out and admit to what we were already showing you, but the, finally it did come out as an admission. We're going to get deeper into that today. Isaiah 17's prophecy, verses 1 through 3, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. That's going to be because the battle that's going to be fought over Damascus will be a hard-fought battle. In fact, some of the most elite forces of the Syrian military are at Damascus. They are there protecting this city, and that is one reason why it has never fallen as of yet, but it will be taken away from being a city. The cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And as we shared with you about Ephraim being what? 
the remnant, part, just part of the remnant of the house of Israel. Now, granted, we know that the, the house of Israel, being the ten northern tribes of Israel back before the, uh, before, when Solomon was still the king of Israel, but after, his, after he uh, had died, then, of course, we got other kings that came in, and, the, and the, the kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms, the, king, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, which, by, of course, some believe, which is actually the king of the north and king of the south. That is true in a way. There is truth to that, because in Daniel, we find out that the king of the south is uh, Melech HaNegiv, which is the king of the Negev Desert, which is Judah, the house of Judah. So there is truth to that. But the king of the north, and by the way, the, uh, Melech HaNegev is not how you literally say king of the south in the Hebrew language. We have a different word for the word south. All right, I think we shared that with you already. We won't go into that now. But for the king of the north, Melech HaTzidfon, this is interesting in itself because the word symphon, not only is it used for the word north, but it's also used for the word hidden. As we see about the hidden ones spoken of in Psalm 83. Another interesting idea that we'll get into in a future broadcast. Of course, you can look these things up on our Israeli News Live channel or Dunun Institute and see some very interesting insights we've shared there. But what I wanted to talk to you about, though, is the fact that the hidden the, the hidden king or the king of the north is hidden and that's what we find with the house of Israel as well. She's been dispersed throughout the entire earth, including that of the British Empire, the American uh, United States, the European Union, other parts of the world too, India, Iran, Iraq, Far East, etc. But that Ephraim, there are a lot of Ephraimites that are over and Manasseh, children of Manasseh that are over the British Americas etc., and the European Union. A lot of those are in there. As the Bible likened Ephraim and Manasseh, which were the children of Joseph, who became two of the tribes of Israel, that they were, his, you know, he crossed his hands to bless the children, showing the sign of the cross. Christianity would become a major part of their belief in the future, so as it was in the case of Damascus. Ephraim, why? The house of Israel, part of those remnants were in Damascus. One of the reasons why Jesus said to his apostles, go only into the lost sheep of the house of Israel first. And when they went abroad outside of Israel, this is why we saw the first churches in Damascus. The oldest known churches today were in Damascus. So when Damascus falls, which by the way is by a ruler that is pro for Christians, he's pro-Christian, uh, we see that Ephraim will also cease as well, because why these thugs, unfortunately, that our government has been backing, and I don't blame this on Trump, I have to say it is a hidden hand, just as the king of the north is a hidden king. He's not just the king of the north, but a hidden king, a melakatsinfon, hidden. So it's a hidden hand that is running this whole NATO operation coming into the Middle, Middle East there. And as a result, though, because they are not praying and seeking God to really know the right way to, to handle things, they're falling into the hand of the enemy and they're doing all kinds of things that are just destroying their own brother. In fact, if you go into Isaiah chapter 9, do that sometime with you. Same thing, we find out Ephraim and Manasseh, they eat each other's arm. What is it? Their strength, their power, and yet they're... Uh, we, I, we don't have time today. I would love to. But also, we went into, too, the fact about Daniel's property, prophecy in chapter 11. And we discussed uh, verses 40 here in depth, looking at the prophecy of Daniel 11 in a way we'd never looked at it before. And at the time of the end, shall the king of the south push at him? But it doesn't say push at him in Hebrew. It's, as you see on the screen behind you in the red circle there, Imo Melech the king of the south pushes with him. Alright, so, and he pushes with the king of the north. And what, what happens with that? And he shall come over him like a storm or a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. See, many ships. And we were sharing these images with you here showing you how that the United States has already developed the ability to drop the Humvees, the chariots, for what? Their horsemen. 
no doubt. They're actually ch carrying these chariots that, that bring their horsemen to be able to ride the chariots, and they come over these countries like a whirlwind. Now, I was sharing with you that this was showing that NATO and that hidden hand, the hidden king of the north, that is in behind that, somewhere in behind those powers there, is working with a king of the south or an Israeli leader. They're in cooperation together. They're push, he's pushing with him to overtake Israel's enemies throughout the Middle East. But in doing so, he's hurting him own self. That's what we find out in Isaiah 9, which I don't have time to get into today, but we find this out in Isaiah chapter 9, that exact very thing. Now, I mentioned to you guys that I believe that the one thing that the U.S. coalition was doing on the border of Jordan and also since they had moved into Altant, remember I shared with you how the U.S. had already moved into Altant with British special forces, Norwegian special forces, and even, I haven't even spoke about this to you as of yet, and it's not made mainstream media anywhere, at least since the time that we're recording this, which is normally about a week and a half ahead of the time of the broadcast, but Dutch forces, now not special forces, but the Dutch themselves are sending in, they've had meetings, uh, I've got inside information on this, that have met uh, with their military advisors there. They are sending forces into Jordan as well, all right? But I got some vindication. I told you guys, I said, what is, what is the United States wanting to do? They want to draw, they're really wanting to draw uh, the Iranians, Hezbollah from Lebanon, and they're wanting to draw in the Syrian government into a conflict. That's why they've crossed into the border. That's why we've been seeing these skirmishes between the U.S. and the Syrian forces or the, uh, the pro-Syrian forces, which are mainly Iranian forces that are fighting inside the country. And even Hezbollah has been struck by the U.S. three times as of the time of the recording of this broadcast. Well, we probably look like we were crazy when we were saying this until we got a little vindication recently when Yahoo News published this article here on June 16th of 2017 entitled White House Officials Push for Widening War in Syria Over Pentagon Objections. Well, it seems like that those objections are being overcome because what does it say in the article? A pair of top White House officials is pushing to broaden the war in Syria, viewing it as an opportunity to confront Iran and its proxy forces on the ground there, according to sources familiar with the debate inside the Donald Trump administration. Ezra Cohen Watnick, the senior director for intelligence on National Security Council and Derek Harvey, the NSC's top Middle East advisor, want the United States to start going on the offensive in southern Syria, where in recent weeks the U.S. military has taken a handful of defensive actions against the Iranian-backed forces fighting in support of the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Their plans are making even traditional Iran hawks nervous, including Defense Secretary James Mattis, who has personally shot down their proposals more than once, the two sources said. Imagine that. Now, I've been saying this now for weeks now. And finally, Yahoo News uncovers the fact this is exactly what they're trying to do. Unfortunately, though, I believe that it's not just a matter of trying anymore. They are actually beginning to do exactly that. Notice the article here on CNN News. Exclusive U.S. deploys long-range artillery system to southern Syria for the first time. Now, that's, they're talking about the HIMARS uh, system. It states in the article here, the U.S. military has moved its high-mobility artillery rocket system, HIMARS, from Jordan into southern Syria for the first time, positioning it near the U.S coalition training base at Tant, actually that should be Al Tant. There, three U.S. defense officials confirmed to CNN Tuesday. Himars, a truck-mounted system which can fire missiles as far as 300 kilometers, represents a major boost to U.S. combat power near Atant, a location that has come under the spotlight following a series of recent coalition strikes against pro-regime forces operating in the area. Well, Again, another vindication 
of what we've been saying all along that is going on that the U.S. had already moved their troops into there. And as I was getting ready to put the broadcast together today, as you can see on the screen here, uh, already happened. Our good friend there, Lorenzo, had brought up a satellite image that was dated the June the 5th of 2017 that was showing the U.S. base that was built near Jordan that they have been setting up inside of Syria. Interesting. And it gets deeper than that, friends. We see that Germany, according to Com News, Germany to start relocation of planes from Turkish Insular uh, Air Base to Jordan in July. We've already shared that with you as well on Israeli News Live. The article states here, just for an insight, in July, Germany will begin the relocation of its military airplanes and equipment from Turkish Air Base Insulik to airfield Azarak in northern Jordan. German Defense Minister Ursula von der Leyen said Sunday, it is difficult to name the exact dates until the end of June. We are in the flight plan of the anti-ISIS coalition. After that, we will move our refueling planes as soon as possible to Jordan. In two days, they will be back in service somewhere in the second half of July. The relocation of the tornado uh, reconnaissance planes, that is. A complicated evalu evaluation equipment for aerial photo shootings is more difficult. It will last for two months from August through September. From October, the tornado planes will start to operate against in the line with the plan, von der Leyen said in an interview with the uh, uh, Bild newspaper. Now, they also note here, Turkey blocked a group of German lawmakers from visiting servicemen stationed in Inserlik, uh, Mustafa Yenagorola, a Turkish lawmaker representing the ruling Justice and Development Party, AKB, told Sputnik that the decision to ban German lawmakers from entering the base was made due to the threat posed by politicians who supported the Kurdistan Party, the PKK. Isn't it, isn't it just kind of ironic that all the U.S. coalition is moving to Jordan, but they find ways to justify why they're doing it? Well, you know, friends, it's gotten a lot deeper than that. And I don't know if mainstream media in the U.S. is going to admit to something that happened a couple of weeks back, but I want to share this with you now. Uh, in fact, it was only a couple of days ago that this happened as of the time of recording this broadcast here for World Harvest Television there. But this Russian article that you're looking at right here, in the very title, at the end of the title here, it speaks about al Tabak, which is right there near Raqqa, that three U.S. servicemen were killed in battle. We see here, June the 18th of 2017, RIAFAN.RU published this article here, and it says here in the Russian language that a brief about the outcome of the confrontation, the Syrian Arab Army, the SAA, and the Allied forces conducted massive skirmishes with militants in East Gut and on the outskirts of Damascus, lost about 40 soldiers during the clashes with the Islamists in Dada. All right, but it goes on to say, Islamic State, IGIL or ISIS, lost 14 settlements in the western part of the province of Raqqa, lost a column of equipment and a dozens of fighters as a result of the bombings of the Russian Air Force in the eastern east of Palmyra. The vicinity of Deir Azor and the districts of the cities of al Qurbat and Salamaya, which is near Raqqa, killed three American soldiers and wounded six more in Raqqa. It lost control over the territories around the summit of Tabarat al-Diba in the east province of uh, Kama. Now, can somebody tell me why this has not made mainstream media in the United States? And I think it may have something to do with the fact that our forces are fighting we know that the U.S. forces have been fighting with the Kurds, and I think the Kurds are, are good people. And the thing is, is they've been, they have no state of their own, which is something the U.S. is trying to do, is help them to get a state of their own inside of Iraq. I don't know if that'll go over very well, but they're trying to. The Turks hate the, hate the Kurds. The Kurds have been the best fighters against ISIS, and yet until recently, the U.S., neither Russia, although they both have admitted that they are a great fighting force against ISIS, neither one have really stood up 
and help the Kurds out till recently the US is now doing so but the strange thing is when the Kurdish forces and the US special forces surrounded Raqqa they left a corridor open on southern part of Raqqa there for these ISIS uh, militants to slip out and go towards Del Azor so I have a feeling that like John Kerry said in the leaked audio, they were watching ISIS as ISIS was gaining territory inside of Syria, hoping that ISIS would overthrow Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria. But that failed. Then the U.S. had to move in. But it's also, it seems to be, even though the U.S. is a backer of the Free Syrian Army, which is uh, the, the fighting forces as part of the civil war against, trying to overthrow Bashar al-Assad, at the same time, the U.S., seemingly knows that ISIS is helping them, whether it be directly or indirectly. Now my question is, according to the report here, it was ISIS that killed those American, three American soldiers. But if they were fighting near an area where ISIS was there, could that be something that would harm the U.S. publicly to admit that we lost three soldiers near ISIS? could have been construed as something else. Now, ironically, at the same time, and this is already made news, you know about this already, the U.S. shoots down a Syrian government jet over northern Syria, says the Pentagon. This is on, of course, this is the Washington Post that, that covered this article right here, all over the media. We saw it first in, in the Russian language before it was even made public in America on Israeli News Live on YouTube. We were covering this, that this, was, this plane was down. But, this, the, uh, the oddity of this was the fact that this plane was down in the very vicinity where the three U.S. soldiers were killed. Could it have any relation? I don't really know. I don't know the answer to that. But it is very odd that it did happen the way it did. Now Newsweek came out with an article, and this is kind of turning the table. We'll go into that in just a moment. But what I'm watching right now is I am seeing that the U.S. coalition is beginning to truly fulfill this prophecy that we are seeing of Daniel chapter 11 verse 40 where he, the king of the south is pushing with him. Now the only way we're going to see that they come in like a storm with the chariots and the horsemen and the ships and everything else is when an all-out war breaks out here inside of Syria. And we've spoken before on Israeli News Live on YouTube, many times we've spoken about how that, uh, that the, that the Jordanian, Jordan itself will become a desolation. And even, I didn't even put a screen up for this shot here, but the Iranians, since the downing of the plane of the uh, Syrian Su-22 that was, that was fighting against ISIS in the region, and the U.S. claims that they weren't fighting against ISIS, but the U.S. claims that they were actually fighting against the, uh, the Free Syrian Army that the U.S. is backing in the region there. And tensions have really, really gotten out of control as a result of this. Because the Free Syrian Army you know, Syria should have a right to be able to fight against them as well because that's the very group that's trying to take down Bashar al-Assad. But the U.S. kind of calls the shots on who we're allowed to, who, or not who we, but who Syria is allowed to be able to confront. But this is putting the U.S. and Russia at odds now. Russia, after the downing of this Syrian warplane, suspended the uh, air incident cooperation with the United States over Syria. Basically, in effect, turning on the S-300, S-400 system and said to the U.S., any of their planes that are operating west of the Euphrates River will become targets. So Russia is beginning to show that they may step in and engage with the U.S. coalition if in the event this gets out of control. I don't know if this is really going to happen or not, but I can tell you one thing. Iran takes from their own territory and they have lobbed in guided missiles striking ISIS targets near Deir Azor because the Iranian and Syrian and even Russian uh, military analysts believe that the U.S. is backing ISIS forces. 
Now that's, that's what they claim. I can't say this is so or not, but the evidence is very concerning. And again, when we, I look at this from prophetic side. I, I'm not interested in the political side of this at all. What I look at is the prophetic side of, the, of how these things work out. And I clearly see there is a cooperation between the U.S. coalition and that of Israel for taking out the enemies that are around Israel. That's what I can see, obviously. I can also see, though, in other prophecies of Isaiah saying that they're, they're, they're fighting basically against one another and don't even realize what they're doing. But the trouble is, is that this is about to get out of control. We're about to see Daniel's prophecy. We're about to see Isaiah's prophecy that Damascus becomes a ruinous heap. All those things are about to come to pass. And it's only a matter of time. Now, I'm going to go into another thing here I want to share with you, an attack that happened in Jerusalem recently. And I, I say this for a couple of reasons. And we're going to look at a, another prophecy that's being fulfilled that I haven't even shared with you about that's been being fulfilled for, for some time now. I'm going to share that with you here in just a moment. Uh, a little kind of change of pathway, and we'll actually have to pick up on this prophecy next week. But I want to share some of this with you now. Let's look at Newsweek. Just the other day, a few days ago, uh, as far as when we recorded this, been a little over two weeks now, Jerusalem stabbing, ISIS claims first deadly attack in Israel. The Islamic State militant group ISIS claimed a deadly attack in Israel for the first time Friday after three Palestinian men stabbed and killed an Israeli police officer in Jerusalem. The attack took place in two adjacent near areas near Damascus Gate in Jerusalem's old city. At one uh, Palestinian fatally stabbed the policewoman, 23-year-old Hadassah Malka, a short distance away. Now, the thing is, ISIS claimed responsibility. But you know, the third intifada that's been going on in Israel now for quite some time, and I've covered this before on our channel there on YouTube, Ezekiel's prophecy, chapter 35, verse 5. Let's read it right here now. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred. And has shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Now, isn't it fascinating that Israel is hurled to the power of the sword, the time of their calamity? Daniel clearly identifies that as 70 AD. Daniel also in chapter 9 verses 24 to 26 there shows that the iniquity of Israel would come to an end. But Ezekiel is saying that at the time that our iniquity would come to an end as a Jewish people, the time we would recognize Yeshua to be the Messiah, that we would be hurled to the power of the sword one more time. Isn't it odd that the third intifada is with a sword? I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Write to us. You have our, our mailing address on your screen now. We would love to hear from you. God bless you and shalom.